Susan Athey at Stanford. Um, I'm at Microsoft Research. Uh, and Yenu Pal, he's at Central European University, was an intern at Microsoft this summer. Okay, and so what we are, what we are interested in is basically we want to understand uh, social news consumption. So we mean with that news, news that's consumed through Facebook, for example, or Twitter, uh, where you know there's a link and you click on it and it takes you to a newspaper article, say. Okay, and uh, uh, you know. If, if you think this is not sort of an important phenomenon, it's actually, you know, like, you know, unsurprisingly, most people these days have some social media profile. And social media are an increasingly important source of news. Uh, so uh, the Pew, Pew did various surveys about this. In 2011, 27% uh, of adults regularly get <coughs> reported that they regularly get um, news from their social networks. And um, during the 2012 primaries, 20% uh, regularly got updates from Facebook, 5% from Twitter. And, you know, unsurprisingly, it's more concentrated for the younger people. Uh, 18 to 29-year-olds, 52% get news from Facebook, okay? And this was an LA Times poll. And, um, uh, you know, if you ask websites, then in 2011, they reported that about 9% of their traffic uh, comes from, uh, from uh, social media. Facebook and Twitter, again, is the, are the main drivers here. Um, just to compare that, like, you know, for example, for the New York Times in 2011, the number is about 6%. About 6% comes from Facebook and Twitter. This was before the paywall. 40% um, or so comes from aggregators, from Google News, Yahoo News, and so on. And um, you know, the rest is direct navigation. And there's been a big increase in that. Okay? So it's just sort of setting this, this stage that, that social media consumption, consuming news that is sort of filtered through your social network has become more important. Okay? And, um, and so what we are interested in is what effect does this have on uh, overall news consumption? So, you know, for example, you, you previously spent two hours, you know, this is a bit too much, you spend like a certain number of hours, uh, say, say you spend an hour a day on, on news, uh, your news sound, and you just go to your favorite websites and you consume news this way. And now, say, half of your news is still directly navigated, and the other half comes from reading articles that your friends post on social networks, OK? Now, the question there is, you know, will, for example, the distribution of topics change? It's possible that, for example, maybe people will consume more sports or less sports or more celebrity news, OK? Will they maybe, like, uh, report, you know, maybe they consume more trendy topics? Maybe what's filtered through social networks is, is more trendy and less sort of like long-term topics. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe actually what people do in social networks is they, they signal to their friends that they're sort of uh, thinkers and you know, they like to post articles about global warming because that sort of shows them that you, know, that, that you are sort of a deep thinker and you're not just caught in the sort of topic of the day. Okay? It could go in various directions. So we are interested in like, you know, what actually does the data tell us. Um, particular issue here is bias. You know, there's sort of these, all these stories about, you know, Sunstein's this, this echo chamber effect that uh, uh, if, you are, uh, if you're communicating within your social network, um, you know, maybe you, because of homophily, you are, uh, you're talking to people of your own type. So if you're conservative, you talk to fellow conservatives, they tend to filter news which is conservative, and consequently you read more conservative news or more liberal news if you're a liberal, okay? And, you know, recently there was a paper by, um, you know, um, Matt Gansko and Jesse Shapiro who like argued actually that's not necessarily true. You know, they argued that if you just con compare offline news to online news, they didn't look at social media news. But if you l look at online news and offline news, online news is not obviously more biased than offline news. Okay? Uh, but we don't know what the thing is with social media news and we also argue there might be actually some, some measure, measurement issue. Um, because they, um, they measure bias on the, on the publisher level. Um, we measure bias on the article level, but I'll show that to you in a second, okay? Uh, and other issues which we are looking at, but we are not, you know, I, I can't show you any results about that yet, is, is there's a supply and demand story. So let's say that, um, you know, social media news consumption is significantly different from direct news consumption. Is this driven by supply? Is this driven by what your friends post? Or is this driven by demand, what you click on, depending on, like, you know, Con, con, you know, condition on going to Facebook or Twitter, are you clicking on certain types of articles more frequently? So that would be a demand effect. A supply effect would be, you know, what actually do your friends post? Okay? 
And uh, Twitter is actually kind of nice. We can do this on Twitter very nicely because Twitter has this feature that whatever is being posted is chronologically listed. On Facebook, this is much harder to do because Facebook has edge rank. And so partially its supply is influenced, I mean, greatly influenced presumably by edge rank. And so it's not just influenced by what your friends post, it's also influenced by what uh, Facebook decides to show. Okay? So this is something which, we, which we're focusing on on Twitter. Okay. So let me tell you what, what data we are using here. So we're using, um, Microsoft has toolbar. You know, Google has, has its own toolbar. Many of these, of these firms use toolbars to like, collect uh, research data about internet users. So in this case, uh, we have several million anonymous users in the US. We know which URLs they visit, and we have an anonymous ID, which tells us, so it allows us to like, uh, uh, say this user went on these websites on different days. Okay? And we also know for each website, we have a referrer, so we know exactly where they come from. So if you go, for example, to an article in the New York Times, we know if you come from Google News or Yahoo News, or if you come from Facebook or Twitter, or if you come from an internal page in, New in the New York Times. Okay? So the latter we would, we would classify as direct navigation. If it comes from Facebook or Twitter, that would be social navigation. If it comes from, from Google News, it would be uh, aggregator traffic. All right? uh, and there you also have to distinguish a little bit because, for example, sometimes people go to news.google.com and then they read news.google.com like they read a normal newspaper and they click on it. Sometimes what they do is they search on Google and they see some articles and they click on the articles. Okay? One, the first one is pretty much passive browsing. The second one is you actively search for something. Okay? So the first one is more similar to direct navigation, even though the news is curated by Google, uh, whereas the second one is fundamentally different, where you actually search for something. But I, I won't get into those details. Okay? Um, so we get, so we get the, the, for different users, we get the URL, so we know what they browse. And we know what comes from direct navigation, bookmarks, or like, you know, New York Times going to another New York Times article, and what comes from social media. And the next thing we do is we capture the text of these URLs. So we go and we capture the text. And Microsoft, it's nice that they have the Bing index for the Bing search engine. And so that gives us actually for most articles say, the text. So we don't have to scrape it because these are millions of articles. We just get that from, from, this, from the index, OK? Um, so this, is, this is, uh, so this gives us the actual article text, and then we can classify it in various ways. And some of it we classify using automated methods, and some of it we use uh, crowdsourcing for that. Okay? And in ongoing work, um, you know, we use the Twitter Firehose. Um, Microsoft has access to the Twitter Firehose, which gives us um, access to all the tweets being posted. And that can like, you know, shed light on this, this supply-demand question I mentioned before. Okay? All right. So, um, what I'm talking about today is, um, is, is, is a sample. This is a pilot we ran this summer, uh, which is, uh, you know, we only focus on 117 news sites. We are redoing it right now for like 6,000 news sites, which we think is pretty much the universe of news sites in the US. But the 117 top news sites were taken from Gensko and Shapiro. Okay? And uh, so we, we, this is the sample we are taking. And, um, you know, there are some technical issues about how to get referral information, where they come from. Uh, let me not, not get into that. Um, now, the, the question of what is a news outlet is actually a very good one, because news outlets change all the time. You know, new websites are renamed, et cetera. And, um, you know, this, this website, you know, these 117 sites we used were, um, you know, they were chosen by, by Gensko and Shapiro like four years ago. But the site is actually, this list is kind of out of date. If you look at it, you see that it's, you know, uh, that many of the rankings they assume have changed in the meantime. Okay? So we're now building a more accurate list, which is essentially doing the following method. We just look at all the referrals that come from Google News and Yahoo News, and uh, uh, we build a publisher list out of that, because we assume anything referred from those big machines is basically a news site. Okay? Now that works most of the time. It gives us all the big newspapers, etc. It also sometimes gives us things like, you know, Walmart has a press announcement, okay? And that's a problem because then we have Walmart.com in there, and Walmart.com actually has a lot of traffic. Most of it is like people shopping online, and, and so that's a problem. So we actually have to curate that list, and we do that again through crowdsourcing in order to like cut down 
on the actual domains we want, okay? And, um, uh, you know, this is how the crowdsourcing we ran. We started off with about 10,000, uh, slightly less than 10,000, 10,000 domains that are referred from Google or Yahoo News. And then what we do is we um, crowdsource those. We show people screenshots. We get screenshots for each of the sites. We show crowd workers on Amazon Turk screenshots. And then they tell us if it's an English site or not, uh, if it's a news site or not, if it's a magazine or a newspaper, etc. Okay, or a blog. And, and that cuts it down. So what we're getting in the end is a list of about 6,000 sites, okay? And we think that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty complete set of new sites. Um, and if, you know, if you're interested in, like, getting access to that, you know, just send me an email and I can show you that and share that with you, okay? Now, so we have, um, so we have the URLs. We have the news. Now, how do we, we get, we get then, once we have the URL, we get, we get all the all the we get we get the text. Now the next thing is we have to somehow classify that. And uh, what we discovered is what's really important is you have to actually first of all understand the topics that are in these newspapers. Okay, if you don't have the topics, um, things are very hard to do. For example, crowdsourcing uh, for political bias is very difficult if you show people completely random newspaper articles. If you show them like a sports, and then you show them something about Benghazi, and then show them something about Obamacare, and then about IRS scandal or whatever, you know, they sort of, you know, you get very, very noisy thing. It's much better if you show people about a particular topic, lots of articles. For example, if you show them about, you know, IRS, um, you know, this was a big news topic in like, you know, the summer. If you show them about this, this, this IRS scandal or whatever your position is, if you show them this, and you show them like, you know, articles from Fox News, uh, New York Times and all these other publications, they are much better in sort of you know, telling you what the bias is, relative bias of these, of these articles. Okay. Of course, you, don't, you only show them the article text, you don't show them it's New York Times or so. But you know, what we discovered is we first did it without topics, and then we discovered that we really have to like, actually go you know, uh, look at topics, otherwise this crowdsourcing is very, very noisy. So what we do is we, we take all these articles and we map one third of them, we discovered about one third can actually be very nicely mapped directly into Wikipedia news articles. So Wikipedia has like lots of news articles about specific events. And you know, we can just use text mining to basically, yeah. So one thing is to take topics which come directly from headings and so on. The other is, do you try using topic modeling with humans then trying to put it? Uh, no, yeah, we, did, we, did, we didn't use, yeah, we didn't use humans here. What we did is, um, uh, what we did is, for example, like you know, we, we used a Wikipedia snapshot. So this is data from April and May of this year, and we used a Wikipedia snapshot from like June. Okay, so that Wikipedia snapshot actually already has like you know particular articles about most of the big news events. Okay, and if you look for keywords and bigrams in the in the in the in the various newspaper articles, then you basically can map most of them already very nicely to these Wikipedia articles. Okay. And that works for about one third very, very well, okay? And for the other third, we do something like topic modeling. So we actually use sort of an algorithm which is used by, by Bing News, okay? And what this does is it, it creates, um, I can show you that. How much time do I have until four? Or? Uh, you have um, till 4.10. Sorry, to oh, okay, fine, good, okay, good. Um, yeah, so, um, so for, for, let me just describe then the Wikipedia thing. I mean, it's, you know, it's probably like, you know, you know, very, very obvious for, for most of you how, how we did this. So we, we just took the Wikipedia snapshot, we extracted the, the keywords and bigrams, and we attach a TF-IDF score, which is sort of a score, you know, standard, you know, information retrieval technique of, you know, of, of basically like how indicative that's, you know, how, how distinctive that word is, okay? So for example, the word and, you know, and, well, and would be a stop word, but like, you know, certain words like uh, give or so would have a uh, very low score, and other things like Obama or McCain or so, they would have high scores because they are distinctive. And you generally have high scores if, you, if this word appears in a few articles, okay? Like for example, McCain only appears usually in articles which are about politics or Obama the same. And so it's a relatively distinctive word. Okay, so you have these scores. And then what we do is we have these keywords and key bigrams. Then we take a newspaper article and then we extract the keywords and bigrams we rank them, and then we compare it with all the Wikipedia articles there are, and we look for the same keywords and bigrams there, and we look for the sort of the best matching ones, okay? 
And we use up to three good matches. So that gives us for each newspaper article up to like three matches this way. And then we look at the distribution of all the articles we selected this way and we take uh, you know, the 50 top ones. And this is sort of what we take as, a, as, a, as, the, um, uh, as basically the, 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 the target for this Wikipedia ranking. And you know, it, it sort of selects basically what you would expect. It selects you know, the top news articles. It selects like you know, from May and April, it selects lots of articles on, uh, it selects the, the article on the, on the Boston bombing, on Benghazi, on IRS, exactly these kinds of articles, okay? And then we associate the new newspaper articles to those clusters and that works for about a third of them, okay? Now the other third is we use the sort of uh, um, clustering method which is used by these search engines to like cluster news, news topics. And uh, essentially what it does is we take each, each newspaper article as a, as a sort of node and then we say the link the link strength between two nodes is sort of how similar they are in terms of the words and biograms they use. Okay? And then we also look at semantic similarity. We map each of those to like you know, Wikipedia articles and we see how these Wikipedia articles overlap. We use both of those and we construct this network. Okay? We overlay this network actually then with our Wikipedia network. So any, any kind of nodes which belong to a Wikipedia cluster which I've identified in the first stage we just make a complete subnetwork and then add this sort of auxiliary network I just constructed. And then we look for clusters. We just use community detection, we use a modularization algorithm to actually then discover the various clusters. Okay? What that does is it, un one second, it uncovers basically the clusters we started as the Wikipedia clusters, but it also gives us new ones which are discovered by these, by these word similarities. Yeah. So Yes, we, we did. We used the weights. Yes. So we experimented with that a little bit. So, so what we did is we used a fairly high weight, like, you know, if in this complete network defined by these Wikipedia articles, we used a fairly high weight because we wanted to uncover those again. And then we used sort of slightly lower weights for, the, for word similarity and for semantic similarity. Okay? That's, that's what we did. Um, okay? And, uh, you know, and then, then we get sort of that allows us to basically get about two thirds of the articles we can sort of assign to clean clusters this way. Okay? So instead of one third, we double that to about two thirds. And that basically is one third is the old Wikipedia clusters we had. Also now what we usually do is we actually add some articles which, we, which slipped through our filter before, but we are attached to the Wikipedia clusters now because of word similarity, and we identify some completely new ones. Okay? So, for example, there was, I mean, this was a horrible story, but there was some baby in some country which was flushed down a toilet. Uh, there was no Wikipedia article about this. I mean, the baby survived, fortunately. But it was, there was no Wikipedia article about this, but, uh, you know, the, the algorithm picked it up from the word similarity. Okay? So this was a cluster where we wouldn't have picked it up with Wikipedia, but we picked it up because of this, this clustering method. And then we still left with one third of articles which we cannot assign, and those basically we just sample into singleton topics. We just take a sample from then a weighted sample, and we put them into singleton topics, because we don't know what else to do with them. They tend to be some sort of unique articles, which we cannot really attach anywhere. I mean, one third is pretty big, but that's what we are left with. Okay? Uh, so this is, for example, one, one sample article, uh, one sample cluster. This is uh, this headline is this, is, this is from a Wikipedia article. These are sort of the various in newspaper articles which belong to that cluster. And you can see that most of them were, were, were picked up by this Wikipedia method, but some of them were not picked up by this. They were picked up by this word similarity and later attached to it. Okay, now we have these articles. We have these topics. And now what we want to do is we want to, we want to classify them uh, we want to classify the topics and we want to classify the articles. And so we had crowdsourced, you know, we had crowdsourced workers on Amazon Turk. We, we built this crowdsourcing platform. And um, basically we showed them, so this is for a Wikipedia topic. We showed them the Wikipedia article so that they could actually read up on it. So they had a clear idea of what this topic is about. Okay? And then we showed them some sample articles. They could go here. And these sample articles were just a pure text. So we, we ran, you know, we, we just ran an algorithm on these various newspaper articles to just extract the article text, to get rid of all the images, to get rid of the newspaper itself, okay? 
to just take all of this context away, just, just the article itself. And uh, then we just asked them on the, uh, on the topic level, you know, is this about crime, about government, about disasters, is this politics, business, science, and so on? Is this a topic which potentially could have political bias? Some of them can't. I mean, like, sometimes about Red Sox winning something. I mean, we, we don't, you know, most people say this can't have a political bias. Uh, that's not me. Uh, and um, uh, so we do this on the article level. And then in a second step, for each, within each topic, we do a second classification on crowdsourcing on the article, where each article is individually analyzed, okay? And sort of, oops. Yeah. So topic classification I just described, and then on the article level, each article is, is an opinion article. Um, what research, what kind of emotions does it raise, positive and negative emotions, whom is it targeted at, um, targeted men, women, teenagers, young people, etc. And sort of what's the author's intention? Is it critical, is it positive? Okay? So we try to sort of get as many sort of features out of this as possible. All right? And um, you know, we did this uh, because our assumption was that you know, if you really want to get political bias, for example, if you want to get certain features, it's difficult to get them really with automated methods. So we try to run like, you know, some automated methods, and we discover that, especially in the article level, they don't work very well. Okay? For example, like, you know, Genskrit Shapir used something on the, on the publisher level. Most of these methods, for example, which are supposed to, like, analyze political bias, they do it on the publisher level, not on the article level. Okay? And effectively, what they do a little bit, they look at the topic distribution, and they say, for example, like, you know, against uh, Shapiro, look at during the Iraq war and tend to, to be the case that, you know, more conservative, uh, you know, more conservative newspapers tended to report about certain topics more, okay? And so this is being picked up. But this method actually works pretty badly if you do it on an article level. But for example, if you look at Wall Street Journal, most of the articles in Wall Street Journal have no political bias whatsoever. The opinion page has a very strong political bias, but actually the news page doesn't have it so much. If you go to Fox News, uh, you know, lots of them are about sports, which also don't have much political bias. Okay? But of course, if you go to the commentators, you know, they have, they have pretty strong political bias. So we, we tried very hard to do everything on the article level. Okay, so let me show you some of the, um, uh, if you compare direct navigation with social browsing, let me show some, some of the patterns you see here. So green here is always direct navigation, and red is browsing. And, uh, you know, it looks like here, uh, you know, People, people who use social media to consume news, it looks like you know, they consume more celebrities and more crime, much less sports, huh? uh, more disasters. Uh, there's not really a big difference in business or science, but you know, there's a very low levels to start with. Um, okay, so, so, so there are certain, so this is, this is just on the super topics, okay? On the main topics, what are, the, what are sort of the, 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 the patterns there? And you can see some differences here. It seems like you know, certain, Certain emotional, I mean, certain things like celebrities, crime here are, you know, a slightly, I mean, especially celebrity news is stronger. Sports is, is much, much less. Sorry, a really quick uh, clarification. Yeah. You said people who consume mm -hmm. news through social media. Is this by people or is this... Uh, These are all the page views. views. So I'll, 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 I'll do a composition by user. I show that in, you know, it's actually a very, very good question. But this is just page views, okay? okay. All the social page views. You know, what, what are sort of the features of this and all the direct page views, okay? Um, if you look at uh, polarization, so we look at, um, so here is actually this, this we do by users. We, we distinguish users by those who are in their direct navigation more or less conservative, okay? We just divide them up in the middle, okay? And then when you do that, you see that uh, the liberal users, you know, unsurprisingly, they have more direct, I mean, this is by construction, they direct, you know, they go more to liberal sites in their direct navigation, but actually their social navigation is even stronger, okay? And the same is true for conservatives, just the other way around, okay? So this is actually a, kind of an echo chamber effect here, okay? That, you know, these, these tendencies which exist in direct browsing are sort of amplified when you go to social browsing, okay? When you go to article content, um, you know, they're relatively actually small difference. If you look at things like in-depth article is a controversial topic, opinion articles, there's some, some small differences, but it's not huge. 
Uh, if you look at emotions, there are bigger differences here. Overall, uh, social browsing tends to sort of uh, be uh, arise stronger emotions. Okay. Um, and you know, question might be maybe that's driven by topics because I also showed you it's more about disasters, more about celebrities, and so on. So I'll show you decomposition in a second about that, and then targeting. Uh, you know, there is no obvious targeting by education, but it seems to be that gender targeting. So most of our crowd workers so said that the social media articles are targeted more at women. Okay. And then, you know, you wonder, like, maybe this is sort of driven by the fact that uh, men and women share differently. Okay. So, and uh, author's intention, uh, it seems to be that, that all, you know, people, the, the, the articles that are being shared are the ones that are the less neutral ones you know, the more either positive or negative or critical, okay? Which goes together with sort of this idea about emotion. Now, here we do a user decomposition. So what we do is the following. We just say, um, our worry is that maybe people browse at different intensities, okay? So maybe like, for example, old people and young people, they go to social media for their consumption at very different rates, okay? And that's really what's sort of behind those differences, okay? So what we do is we do the following. We look at direct browsing. We look at the users who have direct and social browsing. And then we assume that all of them, we just revate their social browsing, assuming that all of them browse at the same intensity as they browse directly. OK? Yeah? So if Matt, for example, Matt and I, we have the same direct browsing, but I browse, I mean, I have double as many social page views as, as Matt. In this exercise, we just equalize that. OK? We just revate mine by a factor of a half in order to like make it equal. OK? Yeah. All right. So if you do that, um, it's kind of interesting, actually. For example, the sports thing here goes. I mean, many, on the super topics, the differences go almost completely away. Okay. So sports. You know, if you thought maybe maybe the story is that that you know people don't share sports news. No, it's not that. It's just that the people who read sports they don't share as much. Okay. The people who don't read as much sports, you know, they they tend to share more, and that sort of drives these differences. Okay. So it's very important that you control actually for the user decomposition. Uh, good news for us is, is that polarization is actually not really explained by that. So if you control for the user decomposition, you don't explain that. So it's not the case, for example, that the more extreme users are the ones who use social media more, which could otherwise drive this polarization thing. So that doesn't seem to be it. Okay. Uh, and if you look at the other dimensions, you know, sort of it's a mixed story. Like. Uh, um, you know, basically, some of it, you know, on average, about sort of half of the half of the variation we see before is explained by user decomposition. Okay. Um, all right. Now, now, let me just show you the last couple of slides. Is we just do this by by topics. So what we do is we relate by topics. Um, so what I argue is that it's very it's very important to control for user composition. When you control for user composition, a lot of the differences go away. Now we also control for topic, okay? So we control for the fact that you know we, we look at like you know how much residual difference is remaining after you control for the fact that you know social browsing is more about celebrity than about uh, um, say science, okay? And so if you do that, um, you know basically what you see is that uh, you know it's again it's about half of Half of you know topics are important, but not not as important as the users. So what half of it, half of the remaining stuff is explained with uh, with the topic decomposition, and then the residual the residual um, differences that remain is is, uh, is is sort of neither explained by user nor by topic decomposition. Okay, so the uh, so what what are we doing here? Well, we describe like you know how news is consumed through these various channels, social media and and uh, direct navigation. And what we're trying to do is basically, we're trying to argue is it's very important that you, you understand what individual users do. Because if you don't do that, you know, what you might just be picking up is a substitution effect. Okay? You might just be picking up that people sort of browse social media at different rates. And if they, drive, you know, if they do it at different rates, maybe their social news consumption is exactly the same as their direct news consumption. Okay? It just happens to be the case that you know, young people substitute like half of their direct browsing for social browsing, and old people substitute nothing. Okay? Now, if that would be the effect, then we, there wouldn't really be any policy implications from this shift, because it wouldn't really affect on an individual user level. It wouldn't really affect what these people do. Okay? And you know, this is part of the story. 
So it seems to explain like, you know, most of the differences in terms of uh, what we see about celebrities, about crime. Uh, what it doesn't explain is, is sort of this residual, like, um, uh, residual differences, for example, in polarization. Okay? So what, what we try to do is basically differentiate, differentiate the effects that are explained by, by, by differences in user intensity and then see what's remaining, okay? And then see what policy implications can we get from that, okay? And so, so far, it looks like, you know, we have uh, residual polarization remaining, even after you control for users. <laughs>